Well, you know, my parents, uh, in 1956, they looked at the conditions in the Netherlands. And my dad was a small business guy. He had a small uh, bakkerij in Groningen. And the, you know, they looked at it and said, okay, we're going to be able to make it. We'll, we'll be okay. But we're not sure there's going to be much of a future for our kids. Uh, that was my dad's feeling. My mom's feeling was, hey, I'm up for an adventure. So they decided that they would um, go to America. They were originally going to go to Ohio, but uh, they needed a sponsor family. The sponsor family in Ohio, for whatever reason, could no longer sponsor them. So just before they left, they found a sponsor family in Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, who moved us uh, when we got here, found a house for us in Holland, Michigan, and the family's been here ever since. Okay. Okay. And how did you become and how did you become in politics, involved in politics, Pete? Pete? Well, in uh, my undergraduate degree at uh, Hope College, I majored in political science, and then. Uh, but then I went on and got a master's in business at the University of Michigan. And so for about 17 years, I did nothing in politics. Uh, and as I say, as Diane and I will say, one night in 1992, early 1992, I said to Diane in the middle of the night, I, I said, you know what? I think I'm going to run for Congress. And she said, go back to sleep. You'll feel better in the morning. Uh, I didn't feel better in the morning. I, uh, I ran against a 26-year uh, Republican incumbent. I had no money, uh, but uh, about four months later, I, de I defeated him in a Republican primary. And, and, and what, what, made you, what, what made you decide to go for the Republican, Republican Party, Party, I mean, instead of the Democratic Party? What was the defining issue or defining issues for you uh, to choose for the Republican Party? Well, I mean, I think uh, really the uh, I came out of business. I think the Republican Party is uh, the party for entrepreneurs. Uh, it is the party of uh, lower taxes. It's the party for uh, smaller government. Uh, from my perspective, uh, an important issue is the abortion issue. It is the party that is pro-life. And so you put that together in the package and uh, you say, you know what? I think I'm a Republican. And so, uh, and I'd always voted Republican. I'd worked for, uh, I'd done a little bit of work in campaigns when I was in college, but really being the party of business and smaller government and lower taxes uh, led me to become a, a Republican. Okay. okay. And then let's switch, then let's let's switch, switch, let's switch yep. to the campaign. The campaign. Um, um, uh, how do you look how back, do you look on, back on, on the campaign, uh, uh, Pete? Uh, what what, what jumps out as a defining, defining issue in the campaign? campaign. Well, I think the defining issue in this campaign is, uh, you know, the campaign itself. It was a very, very different campaign than, uh, you know, anything you traditionally see. You had, uh, you know, Donald Trump initially not doing any rallies. Uh, you had, um, you know, neither one of the parties held a, a nominating convention in person, which is really the kickoff of the election season. Those did not happen. Uh, and then, you know, the last 10 weeks of the campaign, uh, you saw the president going back out uh, doing his traditional form of campaigning. You know, he ended up last night in Grand Rapids at, uh, at midnight, uh, gave a, uh, a speech to somewhere between uh, probably 20 and 25,000 people, uh, you know, about three degrees, um, four degrees outside. And... Um, you know, he spoke for about an hour and 15 minutes. So he ended at 1.15 in the morning. So, you know, he went back to his traditional campaign. The uh, Joe Biden did not campaign. And when he did, he very much uh, abided by the rules that his campaign put in place for COVID. So you would see 300 people sitting. You know, they had circles where every person could sit. Uh, so not very big rallies. Uh, but I think the other thing that will um, totally transform this campaign and where people will go look and back at it is just the amount of money that was spent. Uh, unbelievable amounts of money uh, by the 
by the political parties, by the presidential candidates. Unbelievable how much money was actually spent. Yeah. You already talked briefly about the uh, opinion about uh, uh, at the side of, on the side of Dutch people about Donald Trump. Most of them are not very positive. What, what do you make of the facts, for example, uh, you know, the truth meter of the Washington Post, right? And they're up to some 20,000, 22,000 half-truths or untruths uh, by the president. How do you look at those numbers, sir? I don't really, uh, I'm not a big fan of the Washington Post uh, uh, and those types of things. You know, this is the first campaign since 1992 where I've not been actively involved in the campaign. I actually am uh, put in place, um, you know, in this job, I can't advocate for the president. I can't advocate for Joe Biden. Uh, you know, I can advocate for Americans to become informed and go to the polls and those types of things. But I'm really very limited in what I can say about uh, the individual candidates. And lots of times people will ask me about uh, things uh, regarding Donald Trump. And it's kind of like, you know, OK, that's interesting. They uh, they don't necessarily I've never been asked about any of Joe Biden's quotes or anything like that. Uh, and so, you know, but, you know, hey, if The Washington Post believes that there's been 22,000 half truths by the president, you know, I don't know that they probably have some justification for it. I don't know if that's been over four years. I don't know if that's been over, you know, the last four months and of the campaign. Uh, no, four and years. Kinds of things. And I don't know what the number comparable numbers are for Joe Biden. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I mean, I was just asking about it 22,000 and they're documented by the Washington Post. But I mean, it, it, it's not very much uh, for, for you, at least it's not very convincing. What to uh, to vote for Joe Biden or to like? No, no, the twenty two thousand numbers that the, the Washington Post Post came up with. Yeah. Now the um, you know I mean the, I mean the Washington Post I mean, the thing that we have in most of American media today uh, all of these outlets whether it's TV or print uh, they they come at these things with a bias uh, which is really disappointing. I remember when. You could go to most of America's newspapers and you could go to the, the news section and you could read the news uh, and then you could go to the opinion sections and you could read the opinions of the editors of the newspaper and you knew what was news and what was opinion. Uh, so much of the stuff today, uh, at least as I look at it, it appears that the, the, the line between the, between the two has kind of become blurred and you know, you're reading news and say, Wow, this really sounds like opinion, um, and so um, you know you have to really sort through it yourself in terms of, of what's news and what's opinion. But that's also true, sir. For example, for, for Fox News, right? It may be true for CNN or Washington Post. Well, I'm, I'm not it's, it's just definitely true for Fox News uh, as well. I, I I think I I was hoping I was clear. I said most American media uh, has gotten to the point where you are blurring news and media. And when you're talking about most, uh, you're talking about uh, the Washington Post, you're talking about MSNBC, you're also talking about Fox News. So, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're not going to catch could... me on something like that. <laughs> no. I'm sure you've had those questions uh, many times before. Yep. I'm sure you had those questions many times before. Um, Pete, as your role as ambassador, with the Netherlands, With the Netherlands and America. America, what, what are, are we doing uh, we together doing, as a country? Uh, together how are, as a country? How are Americans, how are Americans and the Netherlands uh, work uh, together on international uh, um, scenes, scenes? Yeah, I mean, th this is always the amazing thing. I think, again, when you read the uh, uh, much of your uh, your mainstream media, you would think that, wow, the Americans and the, the, uh, the Dutch were drifting apart. You know, we're not nearly as uh, close as what we used to be. Uh, and in reality, we uh, we keep building those bridges and strengthening those bridges uh, each and every day. Uh, our intelligence communications to keep America and the Netherlands safe, whether it's from from Russian interference, whether it's from terrorist attacks uh, and those types of things. We are as close, if not closer than we've ever been before. Law enforcement, uh, drug trafficking, the cooperation is is, is very, very close. Um, FBI work with the Dutch. It's close. Economically, yeah, uh, regardless of who the American president is, uh, the Dutch realize that the American market is a great place to do business. 
uh, Americans realize that going through the Netherlands and, you know, obviously you're not a big market, uh, but you provide us access into much of Europe, uh, much of the Middle East and into Africa. Uh, and you are a great gateway. So we continue growing our business relationships each and every day. And then if you take a look at what the Dutch have just recently done in the last year with uh, the commemoration of the 75th anniversary of, uh, of you know, the liberation of the Netherlands uh, in World War II, and you see the affection and the love uh, and the appreciation for the Dutch, you recognize that we also have a very strong cultural and personal bond. So militarily, you know, law enforcement, and from uh, the Dutch, uh, culturally, uh, you know, we're doing just fine and we're getting closer every day. Yeah. yeah. So that's, that's much further and much deeper than, than who's the president or what we think, think of each other. Of each other. Yeah, we're, I, I, again, I'm having a little trouble with the, uh, the sound. But yeah, we're not drifting apart. We're, we continue to get close. We continue to grow closer every day. And with Brexit... Uh, you know, you will not replace uh, the influence that the UK has had in, or that the UK, yeah, that the UK has had in the EU. But you know, we need some close friends advocating for, you know, America's or, you know, arguing in favor of a strong transatlantic relationship. Uh, and we really look to the Dutch as being one of those countries that can help fill that void and give a realistic and favorable viewpoint on the transatlantic relationship. Okay. Can you tell us a little bit, about, us a little little bit about how life is um, after, um, in the Netherlands? Uh, life in the Netherlands is, uh, you know, um, <laughs> hey, we, uh, we enjoy it. Uh, you know, like I said, uh, I think this year I've only, Diane and I have, I think we spent one weekend in Germany. Uh, we spent a few days in Luxembourg for an ambassador's retreat. But other than that, we've not left the Netherlands. So, uh, or at least I have not. You know, so I, I biked uh, 700 kilometers around the country, every province uh, in July, excuse me, in August. Uh, I did the uh, Vudlopen uh, up in Friesland. Uh, you know, we've gotten to do just about everything you could do in the Netherlands. Uh, and we've had the last eight or nine months to do it. Uh, I planted tulip bulbs at Kuykenhof. Uh, you know, we, no, you've uh, been really we've good. had a great time. No, you've been really good. You've been a fantastic uh, Dutchman here. You've been a fantastic here. Right. Dutchman here. So that's nice. Okay. One okay. more question for you. One more question for you. Microphone. What do you expect tonight? What do you expect tonight, Mr. Actually, Messi? Um, yeah, I think one of the things that we are going to uh, see tonight, uh, the numbers are already in, uh, we are going to see a record turnout. Of, uh, one is already done. We've seen a record turnout of early voting. Uh, the second thing that we have seen, is, or that it looks like we are seeing, we are going to see a record number of voters. Uh, right now, people, I think four years ago, we had about 140 million Americans voting. Uh, tonight, it looks like it could easily approach 165, 170 million uh, voters. Uh, I just talked to the congressman for my congressional district uh, or one of his staff people, and uh, we have polling locations here in West Michigan uh, where they're running out of ballots. You know, we, we fill out paper ballots yet. Uh, and right now, they, you know, they print enough. They say, okay. Uh, we expect so many voters. This is, you know, and I'm sure they print 10% extra votes, uh, but they are running out of the ballot. They are running out of ballots. And uh, as we speak, they're at the printer printing up more ballots. Unbelievable. And then, you know, who's going to win? Yeah, um, there's, I'm sure that both, uh, both camps see encouraging signs. Um, I think Republicans are encouraged with some of the things that they're hearing out of Florida. Obviously, Florida is a must-win state for uh, Donald Trump. Um, you know, I, I was quite surprised to hear that uh, today Joe Biden is campaigning in Pennsylvania. It's a critical state. 
Uh, Joe Biden campaigning today tells me that maybe they're seeing something that says they need to put a, a last minute push on uh, Pennsylvania. But uh, tonight, uh, you know, I'm going to be watching. Uh, I'm going to be watching Pennsylvania. I'm going to be watching Michigan, Wisconsin, uh, and uh, Minnesota. Uh, just like four years ago. Just like four years ago, I, uh, I'm, you know, of course, if, uh, I'm, I'm putting in that the president's going to win Florida, North Carolina, Georgia, uh, and Ohio. If he loses any one of those four states, uh, you know. Then the president's going to be, uh, you know, their team's going to be start starting to take a look at a look at other states that they're going to have to win that they didn't win in 2016. But I think those states are going to go for the president. Then it comes back down to those uh, those four Rust Belt states, as we call them. Uh, if he wins, I think all he has to do is win one of those, uh, and he wins the presidency. It's going to be a tight race in your estimation. It will be a tight race in Michigan. Yes. Yeah, I have one question for you in the Netherlands. 80% of the Forum for Democracy, or 70% thinks that Trump will win, and 83% of Forum for Democracy and 53% of the PVV would uh, vote for Trump. Do you have a lot of contact with these parties? Well, I mean, the um, I have as much uh, contact with those parties uh, as I do with others. Uh, you know, so, you know, I spoke at the Veve Day um, uh, convention, you know, maybe three months ago. They invited me to come speak and address. And so it was it was a wonderful opportunity to go to, you know, 2,500 political activists and tell them America's story. Maybe I convinced some of them that, uh, you know, some of the things that Donald Trump or uh, that he's working on. Uh, yeah. actually uh, are good for the transatlantic relationship. Uh, I talked with Carrot Builders, but, uh, you know, I did something. I've done a couple of things with uh, Sede A uh, just before I left for the U.S. Uh, you know, I do things with Veve Day, uh, you know, the Green Links, Dink. Uh, we put the invitation out there to every party. I'm a parliamentarian, uh, and I love interacting with parliamentarians. Uh, and, you know, quite often we will find parties, uh, they say, well, you know, we don't have much in common with Donald Trump. Uh, and then you go meet with them and you find out that Green Links and Donald Trump and uh, this administration share many of the same views on, uh, on China, on 5G, mm -hmm. on personal privacy and those types of things. And they come back and say, oh, Pete, don't tell anybody that, you know, we've got so much in common with Donald Trump. It would surprise people. So, you know, what I learned in politics uh, when I was in Congress, always keep building bridges, even with people that, you know, 90% of the time disagree with you. That still means that 10% of the time you need to work with them. Uh, and I try to do the same thing with the political parties here uh, in the Netherlands, knowing that some have more in common with Republicans, others might have more in common with Democrats. Uh, But, you know, we've got to be friends with all of them. That sounds like a very good way to end, uh, to end the conversation. I really appreciate that you're here from Michigan, the ne Mich Holland, Michigan. Yep. We really appreciate the time and we hope you have a fantastic night. And that well, may the best man win. Absolutely. May the best man win. And, uh, hey, thank you very much for inviting me on. Have a great day. Hey, hi, hi Pete. Hey, goodbye. Okay. We um, we're having a lot of problems technically. <laughs> It's really.